Welcome to the Oh So Spurs podcast, where we are joined by John Bass today, who many of you recognise from the Fighting Cock and other sporting podcasts. How are you, John? Good, mate. How are you? I'm doing very well, thanks. I'm doing well. John is going to be helping us discuss the Leicester performance, but also why we perhaps don't need to be panicking 2.6% of the way through the season about a draw <laughs> away at Leicester. Um, and to help uh, break it all down is going to be uh, Johnny over in Dublin. How are you, Johnny? Uh, to be honest with you, I'm, I'm probably not going to be on all cylinders tonight because I just started back at school after my 11 and a half week holiday and oh, it's just tough gig, sapping, a tough gig, it's sapping it? everything I've got, man. So yeah, I'll do my best. <laughs> but if I'm a little under par... Then it's just kind of like getting back into the new season. Oh, poor you. Was it eight countries in 11 weeks shock. or something you've been in? Yeah. Oh. Uh, and then we have uh, Sai over in sunny Switzerland. How are you, mate? Yeah, all good, mate. Bit warm today, so a bit hot and sweaty here, but yeah, not too bad. Oh, poor you again. Yeah, I know. Um, I know. <laughs> um, but Sai, I'll, I'll, I had the first. Actually, no, I'll start with the guest, John. Um, we'll start with Leicester. I don't want to go dwell too much on this because everyone's probably heard every other podcast digesting that game and the knee-jerk, you know, instinct reactions we all have as fans when we don't get what we want, which is a five-star performance. But um, what was your kind of two-minute summary of the, the game, John? Uh, well, firstly, thanks for, for having me on. I'll I'll scrap my minute-by-minute minute, uh, blow of, of the entire <laughs> game and just give you a quick summary in that case. Um, <laughs> I thought I thought actually... The first, I mean, this is again not not extremely hot take here, but I thought actually the first half, uh, I felt really good about things. I actually, felt that I'd seen a bit of a change in mentality, that we we seemed like assured that we were going to win that game, and it actually made me feel great at halftime. I was like, this is this is really encouraging. I thought uh, Solanke looked neat and tidy and was giving us something different that we didn't see last year, which was a bit more control higher up the pitch. And I just thought it was a matter of time until we start smashing goals in and then all of a sudden this is just the, the perfect start. And yeah, it was a bit disappointing, right? We we basically ran out of steam and kind of lost our heads a little bit when we conceded. And it was just a very clear reminder for me that it's very easy to get, one, overexcited and also over-pessimistic with where we are mm. in, in this process with Ange. And it was just a reminder that, yes, we've got some great players, we've got really young, exciting talent, but there's still going to be a learning curve and there's still going to be, you know, little quirks that need to be ironed out. And that actually there's, you know, plenty of promising stuff in there. It's the first game of the season. <laughs> we've, we've had a lot of players away pre-season. You know, some of those players, that was, you know, uh, a doggy, for example, some of the like, most minutes he's had for a long time after an injury, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right. So like, I think there's just an element of um, we've just got to be a little bit patient with these first couple of games into the season where we're essentially getting up to speed. So, by no means, let's not panic. It's all good. Yeah. Anything to add? Yeah, sorry. I think similar to that, Jim, uh, to echo what, what John said there, it almost felt like the reverse of a lot of games last season where we started slow and came on strong mm. in the second half. It was really nice to see us going out there, hell for leather in the first half. And listen, we should have been two or three up at half time. We weren't. And it went to a bit of shit in the second half. And it, that, okay. But again, it's whatever you stay, what whatever percentage you get, two point six percent of the season gone, and we shouldn't be having meltdowns over it. <laughs> so, uh, but but if we if we continue to go to teams, go at teams like that in the first half for the rest of the season, I think you know that's going to pay dividends for us. Yeah, and it, there always this level of like euphoria, and I think John, you summarised it well with the. It's just so extreme with football. It's kind of you've got to realize that and I hate to use a Gareth Southgate term but he does come out with the occasional good press conference he is good at that let's give him some credit at his press conference but he did say you're never as good as you think you are when things are going well and you're never as bad as you think you are when things are going wrong uh -huh. and I kind of feel the same kind of thing in football with our expectations but like we sign a player that's it we're going to win the lot we're going to win the lot uh, we don't we miss out on one target or we have five minutes of bad football and it's disaster we need to spend 150 million quid to fix this my life's destroyed, you know, burn the stadium down, all that starts. It's just so extreme. But I do feel like the majority of people are actually in the middle, like us, of, no, there's, there's a reasonable middle ground here that you might be centre one way or centre the other. But when you go online, you just see the really hot takes because they gather traction on all those algorithms on the mm. internet. And then they just wind you up because <laughs> you can't speak reason with those extreme positions people have. Um, yeah, but John, Johnny, what were your thoughts? 
Um, where's your I mean, hand other than what's all? yeah, other than what's already been mentioned, I guess like there's some individuals who I think you know, I think John's right about the um, Solanke. I mean, yeah, he probably had maybe the so- chance he had in the second half. He'd look think he would normally put away. Um, mm. But I thought he was really good in the first half. I thought he was mm. certainly offering us something that we haven't had since Kane left. Um, in terms of his movement, his pressing, getting into positions, working really hard. Um, yeah, so I'd be still feeling quite confident about him. And I thought Madison in the first half was superb as well. You know, He was really back to closer to his best in terms of how well he was breaking down the Leicester low block. And um, I think his passing range looked really good. His creativity was was a lot better than we've seen for quite a long time. So, um, and other, other players who've been consistent, like Paro has been just brilliant in, in mm. pre-season. I thought he was excellent again. Yeah. And then when Decky came on in the second half, uh, he's obviously been maybe our standout player in pre-season and he was superb when he came on. So there's the whole kind of debate about him and should he start or not. And it's a, it's a really, really tricky one with him. Um, and the only other thing that, other than uh, we were when we were talking the other day um, about the disappointment in, in how we responded to their goal. And I think going back to what John said before about, yeah, we did look very confident and composed. But then when Leicester did have that moment, it was a bit of a... Without wanting to get too alarmist, it was a it was a bit of a concern at how poorly we responded to going um, to to them drawing level. I thought we looked really kind of a fairly rudderless. We did, it looked like we we didn't have somebody who can galvanise the team, regroup, and it was a bit a bit messy. And in some ways, we kind of although obviously we didn't. It's not a good thing what happened to Benzema, but that broke their momentum a bit actually. And it was only what after that break that. Leicester kind of lost away a little bit, I think, and we finished quite strongly. So um, Bergvall and and Gray coming on was good, was really good. I thought Bergvall looked yeah. superb, uh, in particular on the ball. So yeah, there's a lot of things, a lot of positives. Obviously, the the ultimately the result. I think I refer to it as a defeat without being conscious mm. in writing that when I was <laughs> texting about it afterwards, and because it felt a bit like a defeat, didn't it? Um, yeah, it did. So, um, but you know, like you said, it's the first game of the season, and I was watching a pod. Um, I don't know, the, there's a woman, she's really good at she does analysis on YouTube, and she's a United fan, but she does a lot of Tottenham videos, and she was saying the year, two years ago, when Tottenham oh, Abraham, started. Something Abraham, yeah, is that right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and she said they they lost the first game of the season against Brighton, and then they lost that four 0 game against Brentford. Do you remember? And um, and they finished third that year. So you know, like let's all get a little bit of perspective and yeah, um, you know, well, plenty, it, plenty to be positive about. Look, City dropped points in thirty percent of their games last season, and won the league on over ninety points. Like Villa got top four and lost forty, didn't win forty five percent of their games. So like, I just find it bizarre that. You can drop points in one game, and there can be such mm. a strong consensus that the season's in a dire situation already. And sure, we got to, we can't hide from the facts, Johnny. Like conceding that goal was a worry because we've seen that same type of goal conceded in preseason and mm. last season on repeat. And we thought we'll fix that in the break, and we've come back in and seen mm. it right off the bat. But is the conceding the goal the issue, or the fact that we couldn't kill it off in the first half? Because if we kill mm. it off in the first half, that, that that's a redundant issue. That that goal, mm. yeah. and, 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 and it's sort of, there is a bit of a theme there, and I think it will rectify itself as Solanke fits in, as he settles in, and I think that that we'll take more of our chances than we won't if we go at teams like we did for the first half. And I think the the issue was that we didn't kill the game off when we had the chances to kill the game off. That's mm. true. That's the top and bottom of it. I think true. Yeah, I, I tend to agree with that. I think um I think there's a couple of things. One, that that goal that we conceded is is very basic and very fixable. Romero yeah, just yeah. look over your shoulder and that, that it's not a goal. <laughs> yeah. Right. It's not or it's not like it. a Yeah, it's literally like Poro's on the ground trying to shut the cross down. So by the time the ball goes in, you could just pass on the other man to Van der Ven, just look yeah. over your shoulder and pick up Vardy. He's the centre forward. The two centre backs should be picking up the centre forward. One of them should be. So he should always be looking where Vardy is. He isn't, he's ball watching. It happens, but that mm-hmm. is basic, which sounds like it's really annoying, and it is. 
But if if that's me and I'm a coach, I'm like, well, if it's a really basic issue that your centre back just didn't mm. look over his shoulder, you can fix that pretty quickly. Yeah. And I think we had like some other issues last year around set pieces that were concerning because that was more like just why are we so bad at like having if anyone has a corner, basically it's a goal, right? That was a quite a big problem for us. I think with with this particular goal, it's like they didn't really create that much. It wasn't like we were getting ripped apart and we couldn't figure out what it is. So I think that's one piece which, yes, we sh- should sort it out. We haven't, but we should. And I think the thing that we need to sort out is a fairly easy fix. I do think the attacking stuff is really interesting, though. And that, that, to me, is like the bigger concern, which is that we did have chances. And Solanke, I think on another day, slots at least one of the chances he had. Um, yeah. And again, I'm going to put that down to it's his first game for us, right? And he hasn't really been with the team that long and it's start of the season, all the rest of it. Um, the thing for me is like just slight issue with selection against certain teams. And I tweeted something about this earlier around teams that play low block. Starting Johnson just doesn't make sense for me. Like he's a player you want mm. when you're on a counter attack and there's space in behind. He's not a player that's going to break um, teams down. And we saw that with Kudasevsky, as Johnny said, right? When he came on, he just he completely changed the way we could attack. And also the same with with Bergvall having him on the pitch at like you know actually just trying to make things happen so for me it's a case of like we just need to think about the selection against the opponents Leicester and also the Everton game coming up they're both mm. it's, they're going to sit deep they're going to try and bring on that way of playing I think like just some slight changes to our attack in those ga- games as I said like you go 3-0 up and it's irrelevant if you concede one in the 90th minute who cares so I think yeah. you know I think these are things that Andrew's aware of right and we'll make those changes so yeah and as well like been mentioned before um numerous times is the whole defense didn't play with each other all pre-season so mm. you've basically got this is that that is their kind of first pre-season game yeah. but it's in yeah. a premier and if that happened in pre-season you'd be going it's the first game back from their holidays give them a break but because it's the premier league you're like there's no time for mistakes now but it will take four five six games until that back four is going oh i remember this i remember how you like to be and have you seen that video of Berbatov talking through his goal at Man United before? It's really it's what he scores this beautiful goal and he talks through the whole of his mindset through it. And what I found really interesting, he's like, this goal was carved out from me knowing my teammates as so well. Because he's like, mm. the ball goes to uh, Nanny just before it crossed into him. And he's like, a normal striker would be in the six yard box now looking for that ball. But I know Nanny will always do three step overs, stop. <laughs> run at his man, stop, realise he can't beat him, and then pass it back to, I think it was Skulls, who will then cross it to me. Like, because he just knows the pattern of how his teammates work. So he watched Berzov just stop and start walking. And like, he did, I'm not getting the six yard, I know it's coming, I know it's coming. And he just waits for it perfectly and taps it in. I feel it's the same for kind of defenders as it is for, and Slanky's the same with attack, right? He's getting in positions that worked for him at Bournemouth. Hmm. But at Spurs, he's like, I don't know how Brennan Johnson thinks yet. I don't know how... Um, Son thinks, yeah, I don't know how they play yet. And he's just going off instinct and that will adapt over time and improve mm-hmm. over time. Yeah. We're talking of wingers, guys. Um, right wing is a big topic. We've got another game coming up, but it leaves a question mark, doesn't it? Does, does Johnson, John, you mentioned he's not great against the low block and we're probably expecting that against Everton, right? But who are you expecting to go on the right wing for that game? I think based on what we saw in his like sub appearance, I think for me personally, like in these type of games, I would start Kulisevsky on the right, Son on the left, Solanke down the middle. Um, I, ju- I just feel like you basically have, I know Son's not as quick as he was when he was 25, right? but he's still able to beat most defenders for pace. He still offers you that directness. <clears throat> he can cut in and shoot. He can kind of go either side, and that, that's what he brings. And on the other side, if you play Kulisewski, you have someone who's more of a dribbler, right? He's not the kind of uh, Doku-type dribbler, but he's certainly a player who can roll people and go past people and create those different angles. And I think that's what you need to break down these defences. Like someone who's a pace merchant like Werner or Johnson, there's no if there's no space to run into, it kind of negates their ability to be able mm. to do that. Um so, yeah, for me, it would be Kudasevsky. I think that that is, like, the obvious choice. Plus, I think his form since pre-season, including his uh, you know, appearance against Leicester, has warranted it as well. I think he's playing really well. There's been reports of Odebear and training, though, on right wing. Do you think... I always get excited by these ideas, and then <laughs> the manager's always like, no, they're not ready yet. <laughs> yeah, you get to, yeah. I, I would, like, with, with Odebear, it's one of those, right? Like, I... 
I didn't see him much for Burnley. I, I honestly don't know much about him. I'm one of these people that I don't like look at stats. I just wait until I've seen them and seen them enough mm-hmm. times to, to make a decision based on whether or not they're going to be good. Um, so for me, it's a case of like, I'm excited by it because I, you know none of us saw it coming. There was no ITK on that one. Like it just kind of dropped out <laughs> nowhere. Um, but I don't know a lot about him. So in my mind, it's like, I'd love to see him involved, um, but it wouldn't be a starting place just yet for me. I don't think he's like established enough. He's in 19, isn't he? So it's like, yeah. mm-hmm. it's not like we've signed Salah or, you know, like Rodrigo or Vinny Jr. where you'd go, well, they go straight in because on reputation. He, I think he needs to earn his place, but I'd be excited to see him enter the fray and, and be part of, you know, the squad potentially. Mm. He's, uh, I think the easiest summary people have made of him is he's the dribbly winger. But then, okay. like you say, it's it's like Brian Hill was a dribbly winger. Yeah. <laughs> so we don't know. He could be the best winger since Aaron Lennon that we've had. Or he could be Brian Hill 2.0. Well, company, we seems to rate, company seems <laughs> to rate him really highly, didn't he? I think there was a yeah. quote from Company where he said, listen, there's nothing I can say about him. Mm-hmm. Nobody knows how good this fella is because he's just amazing. Yeah. Wow. And so, you know, if, if he's seeing that and you, like you, John, I, I, I don't know the stats. I haven't had a look at the stats. I, I've not seen him play. But if you've got a manager that says, like, this guy is unbelievable, then, yeah. you know, there's no need to say that mm. in public unless you've seen something that is unbelievable. Well, the left-hand side, Johnny, is a bit of a talking point as well. I so, guess you would have seen there was, uh, unsurprisingly, some extreme, more extreme opinions on that we all know sons look he's not he is past his peak that's fine that's just natural when you're 32 but it doesn't mean you're rubbish like Mo Salah's still doing it for Liverpool and we've seen plenty of players still be very good into their 30s maybe we know he's not what he was but do you think it's was it a red flag son's performance or was it what did you think of it overall uh I I I find it impossible to not to be way too emotional when it comes to Son. Like probably a lot of Spurs supporters, I I, I love him. I I mean, I think most of us love him more than we ever loved Kane. And um, definitely. So it's it's it. I find it difficult to kind of be critical. And I mean, obviously he was the year before it comes Conte's kind of last season. He was really off because he was injured pretty much for the whole season. Last year, he was certainly back significantly better, but then he was being played more centrally a lot of the time. So I, I guess now that the, the positive, opt- optimistic side of us is thinking, oh, he's, he's going to be back where he has the greatest impact in, o- over his career on the left. Um, and it's like we, what we've already said. It's like it's quite easy to just look at a couple of performances or a few of performances yeah. and focus on the things that you are automatically a little bit nervous about it's like i mean it's a bit of a strange tangent perhaps but i'm looking at my dog and she's getting more white hairs all the time and like and she's only seven like so she's hopefully got a long way to go but i I can't bear the thought of her not being around and she's you know instead of just enjoying my dog and throwing the ball i'm thinking (laughs) about this sometimes and it's a bit like that with sunny like he's still got years to go like really yeah. weird comparison but in in some ways you know he, i sort of see him doing things that are that he wouldn't have done before or especially the sort of the instinctive side of things i i was i i was a little bit concerned the other day because some of the stuff we saw last year was in my opinion quite prevalent some people were really supportive of him but i thought his just is, is willing to, to back himself there was one opportunity mm-hmm. When he normally would, he sort of take the ball on that corner of the box on the left. We usually see him step in and whip the ball to the far corner with inside of his right, and instead he played um, somebody down the the left flank, really some someone in there, it might have been Madison, I can't remember, but but it was like, well, Sonny, you normally back yourself with those, and you've scored so many goals from that position, and there's been a couple of times we just like he's hesitated when he wouldn't mm. normally have hesitated and he's not taken on the shot or he's not played a ball as early as he would. So I suppose that's what I, I'm probably looking at these and overreacting because I'm, I'm sort of so protective and so fearful and he means so mm. much. Mm. And, and for that reason, I can't be like, Jim, you, you, we've had conversations last year and you said you would cash in and you'd take the 60 or 70 million last year and just be sort of cold blooded about it. And I, 
I can't really do that when when it comes to sun mm. because no, it's that, too difficult, you know. And yeah, it's because I, I was more the mindset <clears throat> that you should keep him, but mm. if you identified the perfect wow, we've found you know a Christian Romero quality type signing, at, you know, is at centre back, but for the left wing, someone like that, you go, wow, this is like yeah. what, amazing opportunity to get them, but. To get them, we need to free mm. up funds to get them. And Saudi clubs are saying some wouldn't go to a Saudi club anyway. He's too ambitious, yeah, I yeah. think, to go right now. But let's say, I don't know, just to say Bayern Munich say, here's 70 million quid. Mm. In that perfect scenario, I'd say we should consider that it's time to maybe say goodbye to the family dog, as it were, and <laughs> leave on a high. But my fear is he's last year of his contract now. And he might mm. say, we might say to him end of the season, we've got this this new young player coming through, Mickey, Mikey Moore, whoever it is, Yang, you're going to start to be rotated. You know, you, you're not our captain anymore. We need our captain to start. Mm. It's now Romero. He might say, I don't want that. I'm not signing my extension. I am going to take an offer and go abroad and go to the Bundesliga or wherever it is and start somewhere. Then we had a player who scored 10, 15 goals over a season where we could have got 70, 80 million quid for now going for nothing and he's gone anyway mm. and that's the maybe that's a very pessimistic way to to look at how it could unfold but yeah those offers never came in uh, so it makes complete sense to keep him so, <laughs> is my view but, and, and yeah. so sort of like, i get i get your point there jim and that's a ration, rational way to look at things and it's you've got some logic behind your argument some of the stuff online though i'm struggling with yeah, because <laughs> if if you if if you look at X and the amount of vitriol there is around Son for, after one game, but, yeah. but let's let's just just I've done a little bit of uh, been you know our good friend FB Ref I've been on there now I've had a look at some numbers right and let's just put a bit of context around this fella who is Spurs through and through right so he loves us we love him three hundred and four appearances and. 22,000 minutes he's played for this club and 244 times he's gone the 90 minutes, 253 starts. That's amazing in anybody's mm -hmm. book, right? And then if you just strip down last season where we're saying he didn't have a great season, it was his second best season for oh, us yeah. joint with 2021, <laughs> right? So he had yeah. 27 goal involvement. Yeah, He scored 17 goals and 10 assists. But in playing in the position that he doesn't like playing in, that doesn't suit him, and he still did it for us. And he played that, and he's only bettered that once when he got his 23 goals and seven assists when he when he got the joint uh, joint golden boot. Other than that, last season was his second best season for us. So you don't drop off a cliff. A player no. like Sonny doesn't drop off a cliff. So does he still add something to the team this year? Well, the reason's to be cheerful. Like last season's numbers, despite being in a team that was a bit hot and cold in terms of uh, in terms of form, and when we we're even going through bad times, he still had his second best season for us. He was at, played that out position quite a lot. He gives everything for us, and he bloody loves Spurs, doesn't he? Yeah, Do you know what I mean? he just he's just one of us. And I think that having some that influence in the dressing room, yeah, is it. it you can't put a value on that, I don't think. You know, with these youngsters coming through, having that sort of influence in the dressing room, with his professionalism, with the way that he looks at the game, I don't think you can put a price on that. Is there is there reasons to be concerned a little bit? You know, he's he's getting older. His best days are behind him, not in front of him. Absolutely. You've got to use him differently. Is he now not a 90-minute player? Is he, is he a 60, 70-minute player? Or is he a 30-minute impact sub when he comes on? You know, they probably have to use him a little bit more sparingly. Um, but you can't judge him after one game, which is where X has gone absolutely nuts over it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think it was a steward, steward, correct me on this, I don't know if it's Allegri or Saki that said, um, August games are liars. Yeah. So <laughs> you, can't, you can't do anything... You can't you can't predict anything on the August games. You know, you know, Kane didn't score in August for how long? Twenty five years, was, I don't know. It, his record must it must have been over five seasons and there must be more than five seasons, I'm not saying they're all in a row, where he's not scored in August, I think Kane for us. Yeah, right? it, it was a significant one because Easily, it became yeah. a bit it became a bit of a a bit yeah. of a weight round his round his neck. But if you look at if you look at Sonny 
He he has not not achieved double figures for us. Forget the first season he was here where he was settling in. He mm. has not not achieved double figures for us in yeah. those nine seasons. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. crazy. Yeah. And, and there's always a, oh, go on, sorry, jump. Yeah, so, I was going to say, and he'll do it again this year. Like he will. this, this I, I don't. I find this really interesting, this the sun thing, because it's sort of like every season he has a spell where he's pretty rubbish, actually, like by his heart, very yeah, high yeah. standards. And he'll be like six or seven games, and like for most of the time, people will be like, well, it's fine, because he'll just get on a patch and score, and he does. And so no one cares. Last season it was exactly the same, but for some reason it sort of like really became a big thing, like, oh, he can't play down the middle. And then when he was playing on the left, people were like, oh, he can only play down the middle. And it's like one of these things, but it just... <laughs> He just bang a goal like every every couple of mm. games, and people yeah. would be like, "Well, you know, he's he's scoring like that's not enough." And yeah. I, I don't know. It's like he's always been the same sort of player. Has he got the best touch in the world? No, not really. Mm. But he's, he can finish off both feet from most positions. He yeah. can go past players. Has he got the pace that he once has? No, but he's still one of, of the so. faster faster players in the league. Yeah. Right, he still goes past mm-hmm. most players for pace, yeah. and he's still got that finishing level. Yeah. And to your point, so like he is a a smarter footballer now than he was like his second season, his third season, 100%. which is why he's scoring like more goals than he was then. But maybe on the eye, it's not as explosive and mm. as exciting as it once was. Mm. I would just t- tomorrow give him a two year extension and just say, mm-hmm. look, we, we want you to stay. We know you're not going to play every game for those next two years. What we want you to do is build a foundation for the next player that's going to come through. Like help mm-hmm. us create that legacy for you. Like mm-hmm. we want mm-hmm. to give you like the respect that you deserve by giving you an extension and paying you the money that you deserve for what you've yeah. done. And also you can still contribute in those next two years. Is he he's thirty two, right? So that's like twenty eight now. Because yeah. thirty two mm. in like like professional football now is not what thirty two was even ten yeah. years ago, twenty years ago. Like it's completely yeah. different. I think he's got a couple of seasons at least left contributing at the top end for me. Because I, I just yeah. feel like the game has changed a little bit as well, right? Like, I don't think the requirement for absolute rapid pace in those wide positions is what it was at the top end of the league, which is why now clubs want dokus and players who can beat people because everyone, once you become a top team, everyone just sits deep against you. So that, that requirement for just rapid pace just actually sort of nullified a little bit and you need mm-hmm. a bit more guile. Now, I'm not saying Sonny's the sort of player who's you know going to Ronaldinho his way through six players or anything like that but he will find a way to get chances and take chances early and arrive at the right time back post which is the sort of football that Ange wants winger to winger that arriving at the back post and, and mopping yeah. stuff up I think that's a good shout John in yeah. terms of how does he build his legacy with Tottenham I mean he's been here 10 years he's been here mm. 10 seasons with us you don't stay 10 seasons if you haven't got a connection with the club and I yeah. think I think he would love to see his career out with us yeah. And if we can find a way to allow that to happen and allow him to contribute to the future success of those teams, then I think we'd be—I think mm-hmm. we'd just be stupid not to. There's also that we don't need the money anymore as much as we did. Sure, more money Indeed. helps. Indeed, but we'll go into next. If we sell no one and have a net spend of zero end of the season, we will probably have around looking at previous seasons a hundred million quid to still spend on the on the squad. Yeah. So it doesn't there's, when there's not that desperate need to sell and there's also they can't look past and i know business is business and you've got to be cold about decisions but there is that moment he had where we went through the conte nuno mason stellini mason period and everyone else was at the door saying get me out yeah. I, i'll only be fit when my international team calls and aside from that i just yeah. don't want to be in this toxic place i'm injured whatever mm-hmm. just sell me whatever and then some went where's the contract i'll sign it yeah. Like our lead by example in the dressing room, and then Kane's leaving, and Sonny's just being there like a rock, just like yeah. I don't care, I'm still here, I'm not going anywhere. It doesn't make any difference to me, and that stability yeah. has probably been worth more if you could somehow calculate what it was worth to the club than you we could ever imagine. So you there has got to bo- be a little you can't bit of bottle it, can you? You can't bottle that. Yeah, it's just there's something there that it's just like you know, my missus didn't start supporting Tottenham until she got with me. God bless her. Um, and she just loves Sonny because Sonny is just, for her, it's the embodiment of what Tottenham's been since we've been together. We've been together nine years and Sonny's been part of that journey. And she was like, yeah, Harry Kane, yeah, brilliant goal scorer. But Sonny is just 
she just melts over him all the time because he's just fantastic. Mm. We also, um, so, sorry, I know I've spoken a lot about Sonny on this bit, but um, <laughs> we also don't have, and this is one for the kids, aura is a word that kids use these days to describe players, right? Is it? We don't have like an attacker who has aura aside from Sun, right? Like we had Kane and Sun and Delhi, all players where you'd be like, you cannot give that guy space, like he will punish us. Yeah. Now the players that we have who aren't Sunny, maybe they'll go there, right? Solanke scores 25 this season. All of a sudden you're like, wow, this, you know, you can't give this guy space. The others, Werner, Kulisevsky, Odeber, Solanke, Richarlison, do not scare opponents. They just don't mm-hmm. at yeah. the moment, right? And I'm hoping that they will. Sonny, on the other hand, is a serious problem for everyone. And they know he's a problem. And that means that teams have to think about him. It means yeah. that po- defenders make mistakes because they're worried about him. That is a big impact. And if you if you just get rid mm. of that, suddenly it's like, where's the, like, that mm. threat? Where's the, like, fear? And I think that was, you know, we've mentioned Gareth Southgate twice in this podcast, which is actually crazy. Yeah. Um, but Gareth Southgate... <laughs> Gareth Southgate was accused of basically playing Kane when he wasn't fit in this Euros. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the reasons were people were like, because if you're playing a side and with no disrespect to him, but you're playing Watkins or Tony, they're like, "Mm, okay. When they see Harry Kane on on the team sheet, that makes them think this is going to cause Mm -hmm. me a problem. It makes them react differently, whether you like Kane or not in that England setup. And I think there is an element with Sun, which is like, for the foreseeable, it's still Hyung Min Sun. It's still one of the most lethal finishes the Premier League and Europe has ever seen. Teams do worry about that. In the same way, Salah is not what Salah was five years ago. Mm. He isn't. But when you see him in the team, you go, oh, for God's sake, I wish he was injured. Same with yeah. Vard- Vardy's 30, 100 years old, right? Yeah. Every single one of us, as soon as we saw his name, That's we're like, it. oh, nightmare. Oh, yeah. That's the same thing. And we we need that until the other players start to, to create yeah, yeah. fear. It's also like, you, we, let's say we did have our dream season and we hit the final of the FA Cup, League Cup or Europa League and you've got a penalty to take in the 85th minute. Do you want to be in a situation where it's Wilson Odebear or do you want a position where it's Hyung Min Sun taking that penalty at that moment? And those small margins of experience yeah. are often the difference between winning a, tie, winning a trophy and not. And yeah, you, you, this young squad we're building is great. But we are, at the trade-off is that, you, like you said, that aura type people we're, we're having to move on and that level of experience to take us over the line in, in cases. The, the, um, the famous game against City at the, the lane at the end of last year when, when Sonny went one-on-one. And, uh, you know, you're watching the, uh, the playback on AFTV uh, <laughs> whenever Sonny's with it and they're all convinced that he's done it on purpose. Like, that's sort of the level of respect and... Uh, that, that he's held in by fans of any team because he doesn't miss those chances generally at all. And like, no. uh, you know, I think I thought that was that was quite revealing because yeah. yeah, it's exactly the point John's making is he he's just like he's on another level in terms of his sort yeah. of standing and his, you know, he, whenever it's um, I've got the Spurs calendar up for like everything else in my classroom. And whenever it's like you turn over and it's Emerson Royale, it's like, oh, Jesus, like you know, people are going to be rinsing me for the next month. And then when it's sunny, it's like, oh, yeah, we see, we've actually got a proper player as well. You know, it's yeah. like, yeah. And and that's a really good point, Johnny, on, on the quality of his finishing, because if you look at his XG non-penalties over his whole career with Spurs, it's 71. Mm. And he scored... Um, he scored 117. Yeah. That's amazing. It's crazy. That just tells you how good a finisher he is. Yeah. But he's, we, we should, it's a great topic, but we sure we should move on to the next one because <laughs> it's going to become the Hyung Min Sun special episode before we know it. But uh, <laughs> talking of um, moving players on and bringing them in, do you, do you guys feel there's, you can always need to do more. You'll always say, I want the next shiny object. But, do you feel it would be a wasted opportunity not to bring in another player of a certain position or have we done enough this window to say, hey, we've taken a step forward? They wouldn't have a strong opinion on that. So I think we've done some good business. I think you could always do a bit more. I think that back in the last season, start of the pods this season, the six just keeps coming up, doesn't it? And then, then you've got to say, you know, future sixes, Gray could be a brilliant six. Is he ready now at 18 in the Premier League, first season there? I don't know. 
maybe could Basuma put down the nitrous oxide or whatever he's been sniffing and, and get involved? I, I don't know. But it feels like if we had a top quality six and there's not a lot of them about, that could make a massive difference. And I also mm-hmm. think that we're a bit, little bit light at, um, on, at left back. I yeah. think, you know, Odogi needs some pressure there. He needs a bit of a challenge. And I'm not sure with the amount of games we've got this season that we've got enough cover at left back either. Yeah, I'd agree with that. Um, but you've got to think as well, of it's like ju- I think people forget in one year just how much this squad has been already oh, overhauled. Massively. It's insane. When you look back at the um, squad that, that Ange inherited, I think there's six senior players left out of the squad of 22. Although, granted, a lot, a lot of those weren't senior. So, But still, even at the youth level, so many been overhauled that mm. apart from pretty much Benton Kerr, Son, Johnson, no, he signed Johnson, Benton Kerr, Son, you could argue Kulisewski, even though technically Ange did sign him because it was option to buy, and Romero, there's really very little people in that squad. So we've already done so much. Um, but yeah, I think like you said, Sai, like the numbers don't lie. Like we, every team in the world at the moment is looking after this number six, inverted yeah. commas, the Rodri. Everyone wants, I, we just need a Rodri and we'll kick on. Well, it's easier said than done because there's only a handful of those players and they're already at Real Madrid, Man City yeah. and Arsenal. I hate to say it, Declan Wright. You know, they've all gone out and spent big money on these players. And now everyone's like, will Liverpool and Spurs are like, do we go and drop 55 million quid on the one at Wolves just because they got one that matches the profile and Joao Gomez? Or or do we try and find another way of making this work? Because there's not enough of these players around at the moment. And the only ones that are at clubs that aren't going to sell them. So if we, it's all one of good saying, yeah, we would like to have that player, but if they're not available, what can we, what can we do? <laughs> Just I, um... to the question. I don't know, and I don't know if this is a rogue shout, whether I've missed something or whether there's a reason why no one's talking about it. I just have a punt at uh, Kante. He's 33. He's playing in Saudi. He looks decent in the Euros. I feel like it will be a massive load of money on his contract, sure. But just one year to give a bit of experience in that position, I still think he would do a decent job playing in that position. And it's exactly like we spoke about before, right? It's just that little bit of like aura, a little bit of magic, mm. a little bit of like, oh, it's Kante. Like this guy is like you know, a very decent player still and has that like level of experience that I think the midfield particularly could really do with. Particularly as we just signed like Gray, Bergval, Saar, they're all young mm. midfielders. I think like so having a player like that, and you've seen that before, right? Like where teams have quite a young team and they just sign up like a veteran who comes in and just does a job and like, kind of molds that together. No, it's a bit of a left field shout, but I like, I kind of feel like we need something like that where mm. it's like a veteran player who can do it. And Kante is the one because he's can play six that just reached out to me. So I feel like, yeah, I'd love a six, but I, I do feel that you spend 50 million on a player just because he's the right profile, but it's not really who you want. Or you spend, yeah, yeah. I don't know how much the wages would be for Kante, but let's just say you have to spend, I don't know, 20 million on wages for a season. Might be worth doing that because then you can reassess mm. where you're at and you might go, actually, Gray is going to be good enough or Basuma is going to step up because he's basically training every day with Kante and he's learning yeah. a bunch of stuff and he's improving all the time. So I'd like to see something like a bit outside the box with that. And mm. I also agree with the left back thing. I think basically Spence is an interesting like alternative to Porro. Like he's yeah. a really good attacking fullback, uh, and I've said like famously, people were like, "Poro can't play right back." I think attacking players can like learn to defend. Def- like solid defenders can't learn to attack, which is why mm. Emerson Royale was yeah, never yeah. going to work for us because he, yeah. you can't train people to be creative like that. Um, but we don't have an option at left back. We've basically got Davies, which is the Royale issue, which is like mm. a pretty good defender, um, but he won't mm. offer you what you need there. So I agree. I think it's the six and an alternative. At, you know, yeah. left wing back is is gonna. If you made those two signings with the players that we've got now, I think that gives us a really good chance of doing something quite special this year. Without them, you're only one injury away in either of those positions, where yeah. it becomes a bit of a problem. So, a bit of a question then around maybe Jim and Johnny uh, around does Ange think about six, eight, ten, or does he think about three midfielders that can rotate and do the job wherever they sit? Because you quite often see Benton Coyle coming deep, you see Madison coming deep. I don't, I don't even know if he's got that traditional midfield set up in his head, or, 
What do you reckon? There's still a role, though, isn't there, in protecting the defence, that when Madison's I, dropping deep, I that's agree. not really what he's pre- performing, is it? It's like mm. Kane did the same thing. You're coming back because you need you come to get the ball or because of the the covering of other players progressing up the pitch. Sometimes you come back for that yeah. point of view. But I think, I suppose the six is just quite different because they're not there to be creative. They're, they're there for more protective. And to, to, but they need to know, be able to carry the ball. Have the ball. Yeah, yeah. They need to be able so, to carry the ball in energy system, don't they? And he yeah. maybe well, uses the six a bit different. I don't know. Yeah, HG said it best, I think. When he, I'll read out what he said earlier. And he said, because people have touted Gray as maybe the option there. But he said, I know people see Gray as a six, but he said, Gray is a defensively minded eight. He's Hoiberg's replacement. He's a better, younger version of Hoiberg. Yeah. And Bergvall is an offensively minded eight. He's Lo Celso's replacement. He's a younger, better version of Lo Celso. Mm-hmm. However, what we need is a much better version of Skip. So, like, it feels like we sold Skip and Hoiberg thinking that's going to free up space in the squad and or the financials in the squad to go and get that replacement. We've offloaded them and we've gone, shit, where's the guy? Like, there isn't one. And even Jao Gomez, I did a load of research on him because... Liverpool fans were waxing lyrical over him and they did loads of pods on it and stuff. And he's like nicknamed the Pitbull because you can guess what I think the Pitbull. He covers tons of ground, loves to tackle. He's a bit like, you know, how we remember Sandro in many ways in that sense. Mm. Put the ball at his feet and people say it's a bit like watching someone try and play football for the first time. It's like, I, I, I don't know, I can't beat my man, I can't pass it. I just win the ball back and it's three yards sideways mm. to someone else. That's his, his Mr. Enforcer. So he's not perfect, but he does the whole thing of breaking up play really well. But his other weakness, I think, which is why we might not be looking at him, he's airily, he's pretty useless. He's five, just because he's five foot nine, and it's just not his game. He's a Brazilian street footballer in a country of 215 million people who made his, who are football crazy, and he stood out by becoming really good at hard tackling, hard running. But he's not going to be in the box helping us defend these set piece issues, and he's not going to be picking out nice passes on the counter attack. So he fixes some stuff but he's not going to fix everything. So maybe we're waiting for that player who can be a bit more technical on the ball like Rodri, rather than settling for a guy who's 70% of what kind of the best of Rodri does and can't do the rest. I don't know. I can only guess, but it's a well, tough we, one. Yeah, but Basuma was, was doing it last year, though, wasn't he, at the start of the season? For, yeah, yeah, until he, he got mm-hmm. injured. Until he got the suspension, I should say. You know, And he's still there. And he, he's, he's shown... Glimpses, I think, in pre-season. Um, but again, just, just just when you think you're going forward, there's a there's a a, a blip mm. when he makes a bad decision. But, yeah, you know. But he just looks he, a little bit too ropey when he gets that ball in uh, really deep in front of the four. He doesn't. Mm. I, I just he doesn't fill me with confidence that he can get away and progress the ball well enough. Mm. Does, Which is, does anyone... I think Bentancur is quite good at that. Yeah, yeah, but he's cursed. He's good at that, but he can't. <laughs> he's good at that, but he's not. He's he's not the bassoon when it comes to breaking up the yeah. play and getting the yeah, ball back. So, I yeah. mean, you want a combination of those two, didn't you? Well, oh, yeah, it's Rodri. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's Rodri, isn't it? Would um, <laughs> everybody wants Rodri, do not they? Would anyone like a real left field take on yeah. how to solve yeah. this problem? We can't seem to get Dragushin into this team, yeah. right? And when he's played, he's been amazing. Why don't we just play Romero? as a holding midfielder, because he goes Mm. forward and drops into midfield and looks amazing. So we know he's good on the ball. He's a centre-back by trade, so he knows how to defend. Mm -hmm. Then you can play Dragushin as your absolute dog centre-back. Van der Ven as your more cat-like centre-back. Romero as your holding midfielder, who is, let's be honest, not great in the air, as we saw with the issue that we've got. So now you've got Dragushin and Van der Ven, two giants as your centre-back pairing. It's a bit left field because he's literally not a six. Mm. But I just, it's been on my mind since last season when we were trying to get Dragushin into the team and we couldn't figure out how to do it. And he had a great Euros. And Romero is a brilliant player, but he never seems to quite recapture his form for Spurs in the same way as he do, mm. does with Argentina. And his best moments, let's be honest, are on the ball. When, mm-hmm. when he's got the ball in those like more advanced positions, he looks amazing and he can pass. I quite like that and I wouldn't mind like seeing that against maybe one of the like better sides away from home Mm -hmm. so you just have a bit more security Um, you play the normal back four but you just basically play Romero as the six and Dragushin uh, as a centre back and it just gives you that bit more security it's mad 
but I'd quite like to but see interest, it. It's interesting. You know, it's interesting who, because because he's because he, he can play. He can he can mm. play the ball. He's a good ball player. I wonder whether his progressive movement is enough that you want from the six, though. Well, yeah. You know what? If if Thomas, God forbid, even though I feel this is an inevitable part of Tottenham's history at some point, Thomas Tuchel was our manager. <laughs> I feel like he's the type of guy that type of. <laughs> You know, I've got to really overcomplicate hmm. things and look really intelligent with some. Yeah. With some tech. He would look at that and go, hmm. "I'm going to try that." Yeah. But I just, I, and I think it weirdly it's one of those that would either it would be amazing and everyone would be like, "Yes, like this is insane." He's a genius. He was the one who reinvented him and finally found like got the full potential of a player that was always like, you know, sometimes a hundred the top in the world at what they did, and then you just never consistently get it at a club level. They've unlocked him. They've found it out. <laughs> yeah. But Got the until code. Tuchel takes over from Ange, which is inevitable. <laughs> <laughs> hope, I'm joking. No, <laughs> but it, did, it does feel like he ticks all those boxes of Chelsea reject, won a big mm. trophy. <laughs> when Tottenham go through that cycle Serial of winner. sensible manager that everyone loves playing attacking <laughs> yeah. football, back to the, holy shit, let's go get a proven winner. <laughs> He's in there. But um, yeah, no, but on a serious note, yeah, it would be interesting to see. Why not? At least, why don't they try it in pre-season or something? It would have been nice oh, to see. But, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Too late for that. Yeah. <laughs> should we, um, we'll wrap up though with um, the Everton game, shall we? Just go around the room a bit. I'd, I'd like to get where, what people are feeling for that game and what their expectations are. Everton have got a lot of injuries. They're missing six first team players mm. last time I read. Mm-hmm. Um but they are again another low block team who I feel like Spurs are an odd sized club where we're massive and people come to our stadium. But they're more excited about winning in our stadium. And we have this balance of being big enough we get other teams excited, but not so big they're not shitting themselves. So we just find we make other teams even better when they come to us. Cause they're like, yeah, we beat. Sp-. So like, it's the kind of game where an Everton comes, low block, stinks the place out. And. But equally, it's the kind of game where we could go away and wallop them 5-0 and be like, we're going to win the league, could we? All that stuff starts again. Um, but yeah, John, well, I'll start with you and we'll go around the room. But what are you thinking for the game? And do you have a prediction score-wise on it? Yeah, I feel like what we saw at the end of the Leicester game was weirdly encouraging. I don't mean the, the performance. I mean, as in the players looked extremely disappointed. Andrew was disappointed. I think there were leaks that basically all the players were just fuming at each other and themselves and they really did feel like they'd, they'd missed the opportunity to get three points. I think there'll be some slight tweaks to the starting lineup. I'd like to see Kulisewski come in as we discussed earlier. Um, I think I'd be a bit more progressive in midfield as well. I'd maybe go Madison and Bergvall as like quite an offensive. I think we're going to have a lot of possession um, and mm. then I'd bring Basuma back in so that you've just got as much possession as possible between those and then the normal, the rest of the team I think picks itself. I think that this might just be one of those where we pump them like three, four nil and everyone suddenly then gets super excited again. And then, you know, we have a, another couple of tricky games after that. So, uh, yeah, I think this will be a encouraging performance and it will be one where we all get overexcited and we start thinking we're better than we are. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm all for it. That's the best yeah, time. Absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. I just love uh, just be insufferable when you're on the up and just dream because the dreaming bit is, even better, the anticipation to buying a new car, whatever, is better than when you get behind the wheel for the first time. Yeah, it's the same yeah. with football. I find the dreaming. I've said That's it before in this pod. I'm on the south up a bit. So when we're having a good run like last season, I'm thinking, how am I going to get down to the pitch to storm the pitch when we win the title this season? Like, I've got to go down those stairs. Do I go wait on the other team? It's all going through my head, all this scenario. You've, you've got to get your uncle onto the pitch as I've well. I've got to get mate. my uncle on the pitch who can't get up on his own. He can't walk. So, oh. God, I've got to somehow get... It, I've got to, I have to somehow talk him into bringing a wheelchair to the game which is great, so I can you wheel him onto hoist, the pitch and run around. Hoist him yeah. onto the... Yeah, you need yeah. an inflatable slide like they have on planes, you know, it's, when it's in the oh, land. Yeah. That's why you. That's why you're the big. Or I, do you know what seems to cure people? <laughs> if you put him in the long line for a a toilet cubicle at Tottenham, I'm sure he'll come out running. There you one go. of those. But um, <laughs> yeah. uh, so, uh, Johnny, what's your prediction, mate? Do you have one for I this re- game? I really like uh, John's tweaks to the team. I think that would be. Uh, that would make a lot of sense. I think I'd, I'd love, I think Sarah was okay the other day, but I definitely think Bergval can add something, mm. maybe a, a better chance of breaking down their, their back line. 
Um, Everton, I remember that was the game that Stu was at last year, and he, it, they were yeah. pretty unlucky to get away with a 2 1 defeat. Um, so, I mean, in spite of the injuries, I sort of just think mm. sometimes those circumstances can galvanize the team. And, you know, obviously, um, Dyche is no, uh, no mug. So, uh, we should definitely be turning them over. I, 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 I'm really excited to go back. I was at the Bayern game, but it's not not the same as a league match, and it'll be it'll be great to be there and just really hope we could get out of the blocks and start. If if we can score, then that changes the whole pattern of the game, and Everton they can't they can't sort of just hang back. Um, they're going to have to be a little bit more adventurous to try and get back into the game. So hope fingers crossed we can get something early doors, and and if that happens, then yeah, we we could score a few. Um, so um, I'm going to go with, I don't see us keeping this clean sheet for lots of reasons. So I'm going to say, I'm going to say 4-1 because it said 3-1 the other day. I don't want to jinx it. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I, I'd like to think we can, we can win comfortably. I really mm-hmm. love Solanke to score, obviously. Yeah, yeah. You know. So si, what about you? I'm not sure I can add too much to, to what the other guys have said. So um I think if 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 we came out against Leicester away from home on that opening game of the season like we did in the first half, there's no reason why we don't do that again in the first home game. And mm. if we do that, I think there's uh, every chance that we could blow them away in the first half. I think I think it'll be be a fairly comfortable win for us. I'm, I, I know they're going to sit deep. I know they're going to just try and hit us on the break. But I think we got too much for them. I mean, I'm I'm just more looking forward to meeting up with you fellas in the. Uh, <laughs> in the south for a couple of beers beforehand it's like it feels like it's been an age ago since yeah. we were there and uh, i'm just looking forward to uh, you know getting off the train at white Hart lane and walking down to the ground again and mm. uh, i'm i'm pretty confident about this one um i think everton looks shocking against brighton i don't think they'll be that open against us and i without a doubt they won't be that open against us but i think they're there for the taking and you know they they've sold an honor which was a Big sale for them, and um, I think they're there for the taking, and we'll we'll, we'll take advantage of it. And I'm mm-hmm. really looking forward to a decent win this this Saturday. I mean, yeah, get in. Yeah. And on that note, meeting up at the ground. Uh, last pod, we put a message out. Anyone wants to meet us for a pint? We that we've got about 15, 20 of us meeting for a pint for the game now. It looks like, but we got one person coming over from Australia for the game. Who's a listener? It's awesome. So Keb's coming over. Um, so if anyone else is listening that you want to meet up, um, just leave us a note on on. Whatever you're listening, if you're listening on the audio one though, you'll probably have to go onto YouTube, find us, and leave a comment under the video, or go onto Twitter X, yeah. find us on there, and just send us a DM, <clears throat> and uh, we'll let you know we're meeting up probably in the South Stand. But it'd be good to good to see you for a pint. But yeah, I'll go for similar to you guys, but I, I always go for the same prediction at home, which worked well for me last year, which was one all at half time, everyone mass panic, everything's rubbish, blah, blah, blah. And then we get a second goal in about 80th minute to go up and then a third goal from Sonny in the 85th and we're all leaving very happy with a nice 3-1 win. And uh, (laughs) yeah, that'd be nice. And I go for Slanky to score as well. Slanky and uh, Sonny to get goals. Come on, Dom. Yeah, yeah. That's it, guys. So good chat. Um, A lot of you are probably already... um, following john on twitter anyway but you can find him on there and you do another pod don't you John? a boxing one or i'm making that up no so I, I sometimes will join the various different pods you know there's lots of lots of different bits for lots of different people sometimes they do a boxing one i'm a very much a fair weather boxing fan so like when there's a big fight <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll spend that way over the odds on box office and watch that um but no not not uh massively onto the boxing side of things but um always enjoy the big fights but yeah, if you want to follow me on Twitter, it's mainly just stupid memes sticking my own face over Angie's body and like all sorts of just stupid shit. There's no real like, there's no, yeah, there's no real like analytical stuff. Today I posted basically just uh, my first time ever posting basically a uh, preferred lineup, and everyone was like, "Oh, here he is. He's he's a tactico now." <laughs> Um, so, you know, th- there was so much sh- shock that I'd actually decided to do something that was fairly constructive rather than just like a stupid <laughs> and train. So, yeah, if you want to follow me on Twitter, feel free. But it is, um, yeah, it's fairly banal, stupid stuff. But it's real John Bass, isn't it? Your name? Real yeah, John at Bass. the real John Bass. At the real John not, Bass. Not to be confused not the with fake the. One. Yeah, well, so what happened? This is, uh, I mean, I'll tell the story very quickly if you've never heard it before. But basically, there is another John Bass who spells his name exactly the same, who's an actor, who's actually in 
the Baywatch movie with The Rock. And The Rock, and started, fo- you, no? the Rock started following me <laughs> because he thought... <laughs> Brilliant. He he thought I was the actor, so, so, so I just kind of opened Twitter Brilliant. and I was like, "Holy shit! The the Rock is following me. This is fucking mad." And Dwayne, this was back in the day Dwayne, when like going on? when verified accounts were actually verified accounts. So I knew it was actually him, and I was like, "This is mental." Yeah. So I just thought, right, I've got one shot to like you know have a chat with the Rock. So I basically DM'd him and I just said, "Look, just wanted to let you know, I think you think I'm your co-star. I'm not. That this is his tag. Just letting you know." And then he replied back, basically like, what a lad. Thank you for letting me know. Really appreciate it. Um, like, That's thanks awesome. a lot for, you know, for letting me know kind of thing. So I had Brilliant. a brief Brilliant. interaction, me, me and Dwayne the Rock. Yeah, you, the rock. Rest, so. you should have told him, like, invite him over to your mum's house for a roast. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Just like, on, like, yeah, head yeah. over. We're having a cast meetup to debrief on the show. He lands in his private chat, heads over. Why am I, at a, I don't know where your mum lives. Why am I at a three-bed semi yeah. in... You know, what's what going on Yorkshire here? Your pudding, what's this Yorkshire in. pudding thing in front God, of me? You must eat. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I was hoping, your ribs. <laughs> you know, obviously since then I've been like replaying like what I could have done so many better things. Like I could yeah. have been like, oh, what's, um, sorry, I just needed to send you that thing you asked for. What's your mobile number again? And then I could have, you know, like really yeah. started having a proper, like changed my WhatsApp profile to the other guy, <laughs> had a proper chat and be like, yeah, oh, yeah, of course yeah. I'll come over at the weekend. Yeah, like no send me your address, I'll, I'll pop over. <laughs> Um, so you know, this is what you get for for doing the right thing. Um, I didn't take advantage of my Hollywood A lister um, relationship, which is a shame. But um, but now everyone should know that the real John Bass is Big John Bass in the Fighting Cock. There and you not go. This, you know Holly, Hollywood not, Overly, like it's, it's <laughs> fake John Bass. Yeah, very good. Well, good story to end on, boys. Well, up the Spurs. God, you Spurs. Oh, you Spurs. Oh, you Spurs.